Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Zach Walls. I'm a sixth generation Iowan and an engineering student at the University of Iowa, and I was raised by two women. Uh, my biological mom, Terry, told her grandparents that she was pregnant, that the artificial insemination had worked, and they wouldn't even acknowledge it. It actually wasn't until I was born and they succumbed to my infantile cuteness that they broke down and told her that they were thrilled to have another grandson. Unfortunately, neither of them lived to see her marry her partner, Jackie, of 15 years when they wed in 2009. My younger sister and only sibling was born in 1994. We actually have the same anonymous donor, so we're full siblings, which is really cool for me. Um, you know, and I guess the point is that our family really isn't so different from any other Iowa family. You know, when I'm home, we go to church together, we eat dinner, we go on vacations. Uh, but, you know, we have our hard times too, we get in fights. Um, you know, actually my mom, Perry, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2000. It is a devastating disease that put her in a wheelchair, so we've had our struggles. But, you know, we're Iowans. We don't expect anyone to solve our problems for us. We'll fight our own battles. We just hope for equal and fair treatment from our government. Being a student at the University of Iowa, the topic of same-sex marriage comes up quite frequently in classroom discussions. You know, and the question always comes down to, well, can gays even raise kids? And the question, you know, the conversation gets quiet for a moment, because most people don't really have an answer. And then I raise my hand and say, actually, I was raised by a gay couple, and I'm doing pretty well. I scored in the 99th percentile on the ACT. I'm actually an Eagle Scout. I own and operate my own small business. If I was your son, Mr. Chairman, I believe I'd make you very proud. I'm not really so different from any of your children. My family really isn't so different from yours. After all, your family doesn't derive its sense of worth from being told by the state, you're married, congratulations. No. The sense of family comes from the commitment we make to each other, to work through the hard times so we can enjoy the good ones. It comes from the love that binds us. That's what makes a family. So what you're voting here isn't to change us. It's not to change our families. It's to change how the law views us, how the law treats us. You are voting for the first time in the history of our state to codify discrimination into our Constitution, a Constitution that but for the proposed amendment is the least amended constitution in the United States of America. You are telling Iowans that some among you are second-class citizens who do not have the right to marry the person you love. So will this vote affect my family? Would it affect yours? Over the next two hours, I'm sure we're going to hear plenty of testimony about how damaging having gay parents is on kids. But in my 19 years, not once have I ever been confronted by an individual who realized independently that I was raised by a gay couple. And you know why? Because the sexual orientation of my parents has had zero effect on the content of my character. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. As Elizabeth mentioned, uh, my name is Zach Walls. I didn't realize you were going to mention I was a Green Bay Packers fan in my introduction. I thought I'd pull that out, but that's what courage is all about, right? So, anyway, especially when your team's two and three. Uh, God. Uh, so, to give you guys a little bit more background for that video, uh, I just would like to go through some of that very quickly. Uh, Iowa's Supreme Court struck down our ban on same-sex marriage, a legislative ban in 2009. It was a unanimous Supreme Court decision called Varnum v. Breen. It was a really big deal. Uh, my moms got to get married. I was uh, the best man, got to walk them down the aisle to the theme song of Star Trek Voyager <laughs> to uh, boldly go where no man has gone before, in their case, literally. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was, generally speaking, a, a pretty awesome development. Uh, but after the 2010 midterm elections, there was a newly empowered majority in the Iowa House that decided the biggest threat to Iowa was this scourge of gay marriage. And so they passed a constitutional amendment out of the House Judiciary Committee. And this was very controversial. Uh, Iowa, as I mentioned in the video, has the least amended constitution in the entire country. So to be faced with this kind of amendment was a very big deal to the entire state. And so there was so much controversy, so much interest, that they decided to hold a public hearing about this constitutional amendment, House Joint Resolution 6. I went out to Des Moines, uh, said my piece, which was in that video, and went home. And I thought that was pretty much it. Surprise. <laughs> the next day, uh, there was open debate on the House floor. And the chairman I addressed, and I said, if I was your son, Mr. Chairman, I believe it would make you very proud. That chairman got down into the well of the Iowa House. And he made his argument, which basically came down to this. 
the, uh, the reason that you should vote for this bill is because it will protect heterosexual marriage in Iowa. And the reason we have to protect heterosexual marriage is because heterosexual marriage is special. Uh, you see heterosexual marriage is special because heterosexual couples are special. You see heterosexual couples are special because uh, they can procreate accidentally. <laughs> Laughter is the correct response. Does, accidental does this seem like a good argument to anybody in the room, even maybe if you're opposed to same-sex marriage? Right, absolutely not. It was ridiculous. And as this chairman was making this argument, that video was being uploaded to YouTube by an intern for the Iowa House Democrats. Didn't email me, didn't give me a phone call or a heads up on Facebook. They didn't know who I was. I was just some kid from Iowa City, Iowa, and they thought I'd given a pretty good speech. The next day, uh, it was a big snow day, uh, as I, I mentioned up here on this slide. You might uh, remember this was the first big snowstorm in February of 2011. I'm pretty sure it hit you guys as well. And so, like any good college student, I woke up really early, like 6.30, uh, <laughs> to see if it was going to be a snow day. It was. I went right back to bed. Woke up like four hours later and was like, all right, it's a snow day. I'm going to relax, play some video games maybe do a little homework, engage in some recreational activities, enjoy myself, right? It was a snow day. Uh, so I grab my phone and laptop, go out to the kitchen, and I open up my laptop, and I see that I have about 300 emails sitting in my inbox. It's a little unusual. <laughs> and then I go over to Facebook, and I see that I have about 500 notifications waiting for me, and enough friend requests to double the number of friends I had. Also unusual. And as I start reading through these messages, I see one of them is from an ex-girlfriend of mine. And she says that she saw this video of me talking on Perez Hilton's blog and thought it was great. And if I wanted to catch up and get coffee, she was free next week. <laughs> <laughs> I passed on the coffee. Um, but 10 minutes later, I was talking to the CBS Early Show. They wanted to fly me out to New York City for a live interview in their studio the next morning. Clearly wasn't looking at the weather. <laughs> then it was MSNBC 10 minutes after that. And 10 minutes after that, it was The Ellen DeGeneres Show. Uh, by the end of the week, I had been interviewed live on national television from my mom's living room. I had been approached by a book agent, a speaking agent. I'd heard from people all over the country and been contacted by basically every major media outlet except for Fox News. <laughs> I was surprised, too. <laughs> so needless to say, the most stressful snow day of my life by a long shot and it opened up this incredible opportunity for me to go around the country and talk about my two moms. My tall mom, Terry, and my short mom, Jackie. I'll let you figure out which one's the biological one. It's the tall one. Uh, it's me and my sister uh, very shortly after their commitment ceremony, their first commitment ceremony in 1996. Uh, and as I've had this opportunity to go all over the country, I keep getting a lot of questions about what it's like having lesbian parents. And, and what I found is that these questions are actually very helpful in helping me kind of tell my story. So I thought I'd go over some of those with you guys today. Uh, now, the first question that I tend to get from other folks, especially my age, is, dude, you have lesbian parents? And it's not actually a question. It's like actually what I just said, <laughs> both a question mark. And then the next question is always, dude, are they hot? And it's that really awkward moment where you just asked me if my parents were hot. And I like to say, well, you know, Terry's handsome and Jackie's adorable, but neither one of them is hot. And frankly, I'm OK with that as their son. Uh, another common question, this is a stereotype you often hear about, actually. Uh, well, which one of your moms is the man? And again, that awkward moment where you just asked me if one of my mothers was a man. And the answer is, well, you know, they're both women. That's uh, what lesbian means. And, and my favorite response is, you know, asking which one of my moms is the man is kind of like walking into a Chinese restaurant and asking, oh, which chopstick is the fork? A whole different set of utensils, right? Um, now, sometimes it's a little bit more practical than that, right? Well, Zach, I mean, who taught you how to shave? And no contest, I, I did not have a dad to show me how to use a razor. I learned how to shave when I was somewhere in junior high. I was staying at my best friend's place for a sleepover. And in the morning, his dad walks in having breakfast. And, and Cliff is like this big, hairy guy. And he asked me, hey, Zach, want to learn how to shave? And I'm in the eighth grade, so I'm like, ah, sure, you know? 
so uh, going to the bathroom, he gets out a razor and shows me how to shave. It's really anticlimactic. Uh, <laughs> it was not this moment like the music swelled my voice deepened and I became a man, right? Uh, learning how to shave was really not so different from learning how to drive a stick shift, which I, I learned from my moms. And I'd also like to point out, you know, the gender of your parents is not necessarily the best indicator of what life skills they have. When my little sister wanted to learn how to use makeup, having two moms was not helpful to her at all. <laughs> Just saying. Another common question, well, Zach, who were your male role models? Uh, and I think this is an important question, but it's also worth pointing out, my moms did not elope to some all-female compound in Lesbistan, <laughs> right? There were men in and around my life. Uh, I'm an Eagle Scout, so the various uh, adult men in, in my uh, scouting units growing up, male teachers, men in church, the aforementioned best friends' dads, growing up in the 90s, Brett Favre. <sighs> <sighs> I try not to think about that one too hard. But, uh, you know, people hear this like, oh, okay, you had good male role models, uh, you learned how to shave, sounds like you had pretty good values growing up, my God. Maybe you're normal. And, and they start wondering, well, it has to be different, right? Having gay parents, has to be some kind of difference. And this is the last question, uh, assuming that this thing's going to work here. Yes, it has to be a difference, right? Uh, and so I've thought about this question a lot. I've listened to a lot of politicians rant and rave about how kids need a mom and a dad. But so far, the biggest difference that I've been able to identify between me and my male peers with straight parents is that I'm really good at putting the seat down. You're laughing, I'm not kidding, right? <laughs> I've thought about this question a lot, and aside from some cursory differences, uh, this is the biggest one I think that really sticks out in my mind. Uh, that being said, I think there is, there is one last difference um, that I, I, I would like to talk about that I think is, is worth mentioning. Growing up in, in Iowa, as you might imagine, uh, I was made fun of having uh, gay parents. It wasn't always easy, right? And we have to be very careful in how we talk about this because we don't want to blame the victim, right? This was not my mom's fault uh, any more than it's a woman's fault if she's raped, right? We can't get around into trying to blame the victim, but we do have to be careful in how we talk about this. And so uh, in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, that was the age where the words fag and gay and queer really started trickling down from high school and junior high. And that made my life very difficult. Uh, I was a you know, kind of social outcast in those years, didn't have a lot of friends, and, and it, was, it was just... It was hard going to school, uh, knowing that I'd be kind of a, you know, a verbal punching bag for a lot of kids. Then we got to junior high, and junior high was a good development for me because I was getting taller, and kids stop picking on you when you're taller than them. And I got to kind of hit the social reset button, right? I had this, this chance, this opportunity to be one of the guys, one of the cool kids. And so, you know, I took it. The problem was that in junior high, the words fag and gay and queer go from being whispered behind teachers' backs to being used literally every fourth or fifth word. If you went to an American junior high school in the last 15 years, you know what I'm talking about. This was very hard for me. Uh, so in order to be one of the guys, one of the cool kids, I had this choice to make every day. I got on that bus. I could either sit in the back of the bus with the cool kids and make fun of that faggot sitting in the second row, who wasn't actually gay, that was just the pejorative. Or I could go sit with that kid and go back to the social exile of elementary school. And the reality is that there were just so many days that I, I made the wrong decision. And one of the reasons I went to that hearing and spoke was because when I finally had the opportunity to set the record straight, no pun intended, um, I took it uh, because I feel I felt personally like I had a lot to make up for. I, I was there for my moms, I was there for families like mine, but I, I was there for me. It was, it was kind of selfish, but I needed to, to clear my conscience. I didn't even realize I was being recorded. I had no idea. I could see the news cameras kind of in the back of the room like these ones, but I, I did not see the flip cam that had been strategically placed on desk 23 by an intern for the Iowa House Democrats. And that's really what has struck me the most about the last 20 months as I've gone all over the country the power that we have. If you own a smartphone, how many people in the room own a smartphone, right? Probably most of us. You're walking around with more computing power in your purse or pocket than NASA had when they put astronauts on the moon during the 1960s. Marion Williamson once wrote that our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate, but that we possess power beyond measure. And in the era of smartphones and social networks, I, just, I don't think that this has ever been more true. And I think it's important for us to understand, too, that you know, the, the power here is not just in sharing or liking statuses on Facebook or retweeting something, right? 
Uh, but what it does is it amplifies and broadcasts the words and action and ideas that have always shaped the destiny, not just of this country, but of our species. Uh, Dr. King told us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And what this technology does is it allows more people than ever to put a hand on that arc and to bend it in whichever direction they choose. Now more than ever, we are the captains of our fate. And in the era of digital self-determination, we are the masters of our destiny. We are the instigators of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.